Um, our next speaker is Professor Derek Hang, professor and chair of history of Northern Arizona University. Um, he's also senior honorary fellow at the, at the Nalanda Sriwijaya Center, Institute of Southeast Asian Studies in Singapore. And he conducts research on pre-modern and early modern maritime Asia. Uh, he told me earlier that he had been, uh, he got interested in this um, in his undergraduate studies because there was an archaeological land ex uh, excavation in Singapore and one thing led to the other and now he is an expert in maritime um, excavations and maritime trade. So his lecture is the Tang Shipwreck and the Nature of China's Maritime Trade during the Late Tang Period. Please join me in welcoming him. Good, just need to make sure that the um, laser blaster is working. Okay, um, so thank you very much uh, to the uh, Tang Center uh, for inviting me and for to the Asia Society for inviting me here uh, all the way from Arizona um, for this really wonderful symposium and to be in the presence of scholars that I have read as an undergraduate student in particular, I think is something that has, you know, it's, it's a very sort of special moment uh, for me. Um, my, the topic of my talk today is the Tang shipwreck and the nature of China's uh, maritime trade uh, during the late Tang period. And as a preamble, I think one of the things that we realize as we look through the secondary literature uh, on maritime trade in China during the Tang period is that um, really we only know uh, a fairly small amount of the nature of this maritime trade, uh, which is actually extremely important at the end of the first millennium AD. Uh, we know, for example, that trade rose in, in importance uh, by the 8th and 9th centuries, uh, and that Guangzhou, the port of Guangzhou, really was the point of contact, as it were, for all shipping that was coming across from Southeast Asia into South China at that point in time. It was so important that by about 714, um, the Tang court had appointed an individual uh, who was given the title of uh, maritime shipping superintendent uh, to be located at the port city of Guangzhou, both to sort of, as it were, oversee or watch the international trade that was coming in. Uh, while at the same time um, acquiring and procuring you know, international products on behalf of the Tang court. Um, but really beyond that, there is actually relatively little information that we know of the mechanics of this trade. Uh, it's, we, we, we tend to know more of the Song period from about 960 onwards to the 13th and 14th century into the Mongol period, and we tend to use that information to extrapolate backwards into the late Tang period. So the Balitong wreck is an interesting uh, shipwreck because it provides us with a wonderful opportunity in terms of trying to sort of explore what the uh, late Tang period maritime shipping uh, and the nature of this uh, international trade was like. Um, in a sense, the shipwreck is a time capsule uh, that gives us a cross-sectional slice of you know, the nature of this trade, right? With all the sort of commodities that might be involved, at least in that particular point in, in, in that particular example. Um, there are also, unfortunately, a number of challenges because of the absence of historical context that we can sort of, you know, sort of draw out from the textual material or corpus that we have right now. It is actually very difficult to situate the shipwreck within sort of a larger sort of textual and, and analysis sort of a, 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 a uh, as it were, scholarly landscape. And so in many ways, when we look at the Balitong wreck, we have to sort of think about it as, in, in, as extrapolations of what it might be. Um, in world history, we, we have a term for it, it's called micro history, where we sort of look at a very small micro example and we sort of traject, you know, you, you have a trajectory that sort of expands it out into a global sort of history as it were. And in many ways, uh, the Belitong Rec sort of presents us, I think, with that sort of an opportunity as well as challenge. Um, Today, I'm just going to sort of talk about four uh, aspects of, uh, as it were, the trade that China was involved in uh, in, the, uh, in, in the early 9th century uh, that we can actually sort of try to figure out from the Belitong wreck, uh, the first one being the port of call and process of arrival 
and leading uh, the moment a foreign ship arrives in China, what basically happens to the point where it sort of leaves. Um, the second point being the ownership and local agency in China. The third being the role of state level exchanges and its implications with particular reference to the um, Belitung Reg. And finally, the nature of China's sort of transoceanic trade uh, during the early 9th century, uh, part of which um, Professor Guy, uh, Dr. Guy has already mentioned, and I think it's one of those sort of characteristics of this ship that is really, really important. So to begin with, um, during the Tang period, there were really sort of three international ports, as it were, along the Chinese coastline. The first one being Guangzhou. Uh, the other two were really located in the uh, Yangtze Delta re uh, region, uh, being Hangzhou and Mingzhou. Uh, and uh, Mingzhou, is just, Mingzhou is not located um, there on the map, but sort of, you know, there. Um, Yangzhou, in a sense, was not really a, uh, a, a, an international port. It was a uh, river city that was located further inland, although obviously it did engage in some international trade uh, that was sort of emanating out of China uh, along the uh, middle part of uh, China's coastline. Um, Guangzhou, in particular, was the most important port uh, when it comes to uh, maritime Asian trade uh, south of China. All ships uh, that came would arrive there. Uh, they will do most of their business there, and in fact, the um, shipwreck data that we have, not just from the Belitung, but from all shipwrecks uh, up until about the 12th century AD, demonstrate that Guangzhou was the key port of call. Um, so the question, of course, is what happened once a ship arrives uh, in China? And in order for us to sort of uh, aid our understanding in that, uh, there are two factors that we have to bear in mind. The first one being the nature of the uh, continental monsoon patterns, as it were, the Asian monsoon patterns that would um, occur across uh, Asia. Uh, in in um, between November to about January, you would have the northeast monsoons that would blow in a northeastward down to a southwesterly direction. In term, so the arrows with the dotted lines are the sort of general sort of monsoon patterns where the winds are going from the north east down to the southwest. Um, in the age of sail, vessels would obviously, during um, November, or December into January, they tend to move from a north down to a south sort of direction. Um, by about February, that sort of comes to a, a halt, and there's a one, two month change over period where very little happens, and then by about April, the wind patterns begin to sort of shift, and round about, April, late April into May, the wind patterns begin to sort of move in a southwest into a northeast direction. And so vessels would move in a general pattern from the south part of uh, maritime Asia towards sort of the north. What all that means is that um, if you were a ship coming in from the Indian Ocean, uh, you would sail towards South China around about May and arrive in the port city of Guangzhou around about June and July. And in fact, there's, a, uh, there's, an early tw uh, ten there's an early 12th century text, the Pingzhou Ketan, that actually talks about ships arriving from across the South China Sea around about the months of June and July. It was a sort of very predictable pattern. And then ships would wait for a couple of months, do whatever bit business they needed to do, uh, and in November, from November onwards, would sail from the coast of China down back south into Southeast Asia. Um, travel along the coastline of China as well also depended to a large extent to the, uh, on these monsoon patterns. So in a sense, if you were located in Guangzhou and you wanted to sail along the coastline up to places like Hangzhou, Mingzhou, Yangzhou, basically the Delta, uh, the Yangtze Delta area, you, you had to do it between April to September. Um, and if you wanted to move down south, um, same thing as well, you would have to wait for November uh, into January in order to be able to do that. Um, that had a significant impact, obviously, in terms of the pattern of shipping along the Chinese coastline. It provided you roughly maybe about approximately three to four months between, January, uh, between June and July to about, you know, sort of November uh, in order to get all your affairs in order commercially in China if you were a foreign vessel and you were foreign traders before you had to leave China by about November in order to get back down to Southeast Asia. So the turnaround time was relatively small. One of the things that we realized, obviously, because of the short turnaround period, um, in the age today, we, we tend to think of 
uh, things happening extremely quickly. Uh, you know, you would arrive at port and you would just spend maybe a couple of weeks, you know, to acquire all the cargo that you needed to do, and then you know you get, you go. But obviously, there was a significant amount of time that had to be waited that you had to wait in order for customs to be cleared, in order for you know for 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 traders to be able to get in touch with local traders in the port city, and then to acquire commodities, to load the ship, and then to sail off. So a three four month period in China is a relatively short period of time. If we look at all the shipwrecks that are known today and they have been excavated in Southeast Asia that sort of represent this trade from China into Southeast Asia, one of the patterns that we find is that uh, all the shipwrecks in fact exhibit a very interesting characteristic. Ships that were sort of dated to the 9th to 12th centuries have cargo that predominantly have ceramics that are acquired from the hinterland of the port city of Guangzhou. So if you look at ships, for example, like the Intan wreck, for example, the Chiribon wreck, um, and into even the uh, Pulabuaya wreck, all, that, all of their ceramics cargo basically is a Guangdong hinterland, sort of, you know, a mass ceramic cargo. Uh, by the time you get into the 13th and 14th century, including, for example, the Jade Dragon Wreck and the Java Sea Wreck, um, they tend to reflect a um, ceramic cargo that is acquired from the hinterland of the port city of Quanzhou, And that's because the port city of Quanzhou by the 12th and 13th century becomes the premier port of call, right, under the Southern Song. Uh, and that's where most ships would go uh, as opposed to, say, Guangzhou. And this is where all the ceramics would be acquired. The interesting thing, of course, is that if we look at the Balitong Wreck, uh, it defies that pattern. So the Beli Tung Rek is interesting because its cargo is primarily a mess, obviously, in the Changsha area where all the Changsha ceramics were produced. Uh, all of the other ceramics, including like the Kongxian ceramics, the Xing kilns and the Ting kilns were all located up in North China, right? And they were brought down to the port cities in the Delta area here, the Yangtze Delta area here, obviously, through the Grand Canal. Um, this pattern of uh, cargo, as it were, in the Belitong wreck suggests that rather than calling at Guangzhou and amassing the cargo at Guangzhou, the Belitong wreck most likely sailed up after it had cleared customs at Guangzhou uh, up towards the Delta area in order to acquire its cargo. Now, that is obviously speculative. I mean, there is no sort of textual reference that will provide definitive proof for that. But it seems that you know, with, a, with a Changsha cargo that was as significant as the one that was in the Belitong wreck, that in order for all those ceramics to be brought down to Guangzhou in order to be laden onto the, uh, in, onto the Belitong ship would have been extremely expensive and onerous, and that it would make more sense for the vessel to actually have gone up north after it cleared customs here in maybe June, July, uh, and sail up with the southwest monsoons to this part of China, and then from there, they would acquire the ceramic cargo, which was primarily Changsha and all these ceramics from the Ting, Sing, and Kongxian kilns uh, onto the ship. And then hopefully they could do that within about three or four months. So it's a pretty, pretty sort of tight schedule. Um, in a very tight schedule, I think one of the things that we will find is that the cargo tends to reflect whatever is produced in the ceramic kilns of the immediate hinterland. In other words, the notion of choice is relatively limited. You just get whatever is available at the port city at that point in time, right? But when we look at the cargo of the Belitong wreck, uh, what becomes very obvious is that there is a significant amount of demand, sort of, as it were, uh, specificity that is demanded of the ceramics cargo that was going to be put on this ship. Uh, a lot of the Changsha wares, for example, had uh, have uh, you know sort of decorative motifs or you know patterns or images that sort of not necessarily hark to what we call sort of local Chinese sort of you know um, Im imagery, as it were, in the decorative motifs. Uh, a lot of it has to do with um, maritime shit. Uh, maritime trade. Um, I I don't think this is a Dao. It looks more like some kind of a Chinese vessel. Um, but this is interesting. 
Uh, it has been argued that, especially with the snout here, that this is likely to be a makara, which is a uh, mythical sea creature in the Southeast Asian context that is, you know, as it were, about to attack ship. Other things including palm fronds, for example, on Changsha Ewers, uh, and so on and so forth, as well as some of these wonderful ceramics that you know, uh, we've looked at yesterday in the gallery uh, that are more specific to uh, Middle Eastern consumption patterns, as it were, as opposed to Chinese consumption patterns. Um, this suggests, therefore, that uh, we may be looking at a ceramic cargo uh, for the Balitong wreck that was specifically commissioned and when that happens, there's a significant amount of time that is involved in the procuring, the production, and then the shipping down from all these different kilns uh, to the port city where the ship was located in order for it to then be um, laden and then before it goes off. So a three or four month period, as it were, uh, at a port city, for example, at Yangzhou, after clearing customs, may not necessarily have been sufficiently long a period of stay for that to happen. It therefore sort of behooves us to, to need to consider the possibility that the ship was in China for a much longer point, a period in time. Um, possibly uh, maybe about a year, year and a half, if it, miss, if it misses the first northeast monsoon when it first arrives, it would in fact have to wait for another 12 months before it can you know, sort of leave the port and sail back as it were to the Indian Ocean. So that in itself is an interesting point because uh, we think of it as time, but really it, it reflects a different pattern of tr shipping trade. Uh, whereas it is easy to move between sectors, for example, across from Southeast Asia to China and back within, as it were, a six to nine month period. Um, shipping patterns that require vessels to sort of, you know, re be anchored or moored in one port city for more than a year is reflective of a pattern that is not necessarily the norm. Um, sectoral trade, and many of us who are students of economic history in a pre-modern sort of uh, Asian uh, context are probably highly familiar with this particular map. What it suggests is that goods, for example, from China will be shipped down to Southeast Asia. Traders from India will come across to this side. You know, trade with Southeast Asian commodities as it were, but pick up some Chinese products and bring it over to that side. And you know, the relay system goes on towards the West and the same sort of pattern of trade moves towards the East. Um, if, the, if you look at the archeological um, record of the port cities in these areas here um, that reflect the sectoral trade, one of the, th one of the key characteristics is that the archaeological record actually reflects the changes over time, as it were, of the production centers of things like ceramics, for example, from China, metalware, and other products from Southeast Asia, um, and so on and so forth. In other words, you get a flowing record, right, of the nature of trade across the whole of maritime Asia. Um, what is interesting about the Belitong wreck, obviously, is that you don't really necessarily get that. Um, the, the fact that the ship has the kind of ceramics cargo that it has uh, is a very, very interesting sort of unique point. And this is what uh, we're looking at. Uh, the bulk of the cargo of the Belitong wreck uh, comprises Changsha ceramics. If you look at the trail, as it were, the archaeological trail of Changsha ceramics across the whole of maritime Asia into places like the Middle East and so on and so forth, these are the key places where significant quantities of Changsha wares have been archaeologically recovered over the, you know, the many decades where excavations have been uh, conducted. What is interesting is that very, very, very little and extremely minimal Changsha ceramics have in fact been recovered in this area. Um, but it suggests is that Changsha as an export ceramic from China during this period of time really was primarily intended for this part of maritime Asia or, in, or, or the old world. Um, Changsha ceramics were, were not really demanded in island Southeast Asia. Um, in 2010, the um, Nalanda Sri Vijaya Center had a uh, archeological excavation in the Dihang Plateau in Java Island and they, they recovered quite a lot of ceramics. The Dihang Plateau is dated to about the 6th to the 8th centuries AD. And one of the things that uh, was absent 
uh, were Changsha ceramics. There were only about two or three shirts that were recovered compared to a lot of other types of ceramics uh, that were from China. So the Balitong Rex um, cargo suggests that I think we are looking at a cargo that was primarily intended not for the sectoral trade, as this map might suggest here, but in fact, it was a transoceanic trade that would go all the way towards the western end of the Indian Ocean, um, which is in, 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 in and of itself a very unique, as it were, uh, pattern of trade during this period of time. Um, when Michael Flecker, who was the marine archaeologist who worked on the site in the, in the second year of the excavation season, um, as he reconstructed the um, hull, the cross-section of the hull, uh, of the wreck, uh, about four meters into you know, the front, as it were, into the ship. This is what the reconstruction of the wreck looked like. So you have the vessel, all that's pretty normal. This part is an interesting one, where there was a pile of lead ingots here, on top of which were planks that would have been placed. So this is for the ballast, you know, you balance the ship that way with the lead ingots. And then on top of it is where the ceramics would be located. Um, the bulk of the Changsha ceramics being basically located above almost all the other types of cargo that was on the vessel suggests that the ship had no intention of calling in Southeast Asia. It may have just stopped there, but the point was that it was just going to go straight towards the, um, towards the Arabian Sea. Um, and so this is an interesting sort of, uh, uh, sort of uh, picture of what the sailing pattern, as it were, of the Balitong wreck uh, vessel uh, and the intent and the end market, as it were. So the question, of course, is which Middle Eastern network are we looking at then? Um, you know, did all Middle Eastern networks uh, that necessarily sort of arrive at China, you know, sort of adhere to this pattern of shipping, or are we perhaps looking at something fairly unique? And this goes to the um, differentiation between perhaps two major Middle Eastern uh, ethnic um, trading sort of diaspora uh, in China at that point in time, um, which uh, Dr. Guy had sort of uh, mentioned and alluded to just now. Um, the Chinese were actually quite uh, critically attuned to um, the differences between different Middle Eastern groups that were arriving in China or resident in China at that point in time. Two of the biggest groups that they were aware of was the Puasi, uh, or Persians. Uh, references for them appeared very early in Chinese textual material, um, but it was primarily a political reference point for the Sasanian dynasty, uh, which obviously came to an end around about the 630s because they lost their state to the Arabs um, in the Middle East. Middle East. Part of that court, the Sasanian court, um, were dispersed and a, a, a section of that arrived in China and remained in exile in China was sojourning in China, and a significant proportion of the Persian community ended up in the, in the city of Yangzhou. Um, by about the 7th and 8th centuries, uh, Chinese texts begin to have another term for Middle Eastern, uh, Middle Easterners appear in their sort of textual record, and that was the Tashi or the Arabs. Um, and the Arabs were obviously in an ascendancy from about the 7th and late 7th into the 8th centuries uh, AD onwards. In 751, the Battle of Talas in particular, I think brought to mind in the Chinese the importance and the preeminence of the Abbasid dynasty. Um, and once the Abbasid dynasty establishes ca its capital uh, in Baghdad, um, the whole sort of shipping network, as it were, that was emanating out of the Persian Gulf, uh, and into the Arabian Sea became something that was under you know, uh, the Abbasid dynasty purview. Right? The, the key thing about this, obviously, is the implications of the different networks that we're looking at here and the shipping capabilities. Um, and we can see that in two examples in the port cities in China. Guangzhou, for example, uh, which was noted in Chinese texts to have been you know, predominantly um, uh, in terms of the Middle Eastern population there, under sort of, you know, uh, the Tash or the Arab sort of, you know, as it was an Arab do domain, um, had a particular way of responding to crisis in China uh, in the 8th century uh, when there was a significant amount of political upheaval uh, in Tang China. So in 750 AD, 
um, for whatever reasons, uh, uh, corruption being one, um, political instability being another, um, the Arab community there in 758 pillaged the warehouses in Guangzhou, burned you know, part of the city. And one of the things that was really interesting was that they acted as it were as, as, as a unit, right, as a social unit. Um, they, they did all of their damage in the port city of, of Guangzhou, and then they retreated uh, down to Southeast Asia, where they established themselves there for the next century or so. They don't, they don't really sort of come back to the port city of China again until about the, the early um, 10th century. Uh, in the port city of Yangzhou, on the other hand, in 760, uh, you have a Chinese rebellion which massacred a significant number of uh, Middle Easterners there. Um, once that happened, a couple of years down the road, the foreign population basically reconstituted itself extremely quickly. Um, but what was really interesting is that there was not a similar ability, I think, to retreat into Southeast Asia, uh, which suggests that the shipping networks that were there in, in Yangtze were not as you know, sort of you know, steady, stabilized, or necessarily even had the knowledge of Southeast Asia that you saw in the uh, Middle Eastern networks, for example, they're emanating out of the uh, port city of, of, of Guangzhou. Now, if we bring all of that together, one of the things that we may be able to think about then, therefore, is that uh, we are looking at different networks, basically. Uh, in terms of the Belitong vessel and where it was sort of plugging into in terms of the Middle Eastern network. If it was Yangzhou, then likely it was a network that did not have the kind of shipping capabilities that we were seeing uh, amongst the Arabs, for example, uh, which were sort of operating out of the port city of Guangzhou. The final point I think I want to sort of raise really is the, um, the gold vessels that were recovered in the ship. Now, they were very important because obviously, uh, they're extremely unique in terms of the archaeological re record uh, for, you know, sort of Chinese metalware of this period of time, right? Um, they're very limited in terms of the record. Uh, there really are just very few uh, instances where we've, we've got examples of this. Um, one example would be the hoard of um, gold items, for example, that was discovered in the Nara tombs. Um, another one is actually just one or two items from the um, the Farman Si, uh, which is a key, you know, sort of a Buddhist uh, geographical or spiritual location, cosmological location for the Tang Dynasty. And there were just about two or three examples of those, right? Um, and in the tombs of extremely high-ranking um, individuals of the first half of the Tang Dynasty. And that's it. Everything else that we we know in terms of precious metal items, uh, in fact, were from uh, were, were were silver items that sort of you know that that look beautiful. And it's only in the in the Belitong wreck that we see the gold examples of these. Um, gold usage in Tang Dynasty is really sort of um, fairly well known in the sense that it was used as a unit of measure for international trade, large transactions would be sometimes valued in gold. Um, but in terms of gold articles, the usage was extremely rare. Um, a survey of all the tribute missions that, uh, and diplomatic missions between the Tang court and international sort of you know, trading partners really only demonstrated that there were only four incidents of mention of gold items that were exchanged as part of diplomatic missions. Three of them with the kingdoms of Korea, uh, of the Korean Peninsula, and the last one being Sri Vijaya, which is down in Palembang in the, the island of Sumatra today. And that's basically it, okay? Um, of course, we know the dating of the Belitung wreck would be sometime after 826, right, because of that bowl that had the inscription of the date on it. And so if we look at all the, the diplomatic missions that the Tang court had, with Middle Eastern sort of um, entities, as it were, being the Persians on the left and the, um, the Arabs on the right. The key thing that we need to bear in mind is the fact that after 798, the Arabs were not recorded to have sent another mission until 924 to China. Uh, the Persians sent one more mission after the end of the 8th century, and that occurred in 824. Um, the record in, in the Chinese text is actually quite cursory, and it mentions, this is all it mentions, right? In the ninth month of the year 824, um, a Persian 
Persian named Li Shusa presented a small pavilion made of sinking garu wood incense, and that's actually recorded in Zhi Tongjian. Um, of course, the question, it opens more questions than we can, I think, possibly resolve, right? So the question being, who is this guy, right? Um, uh, was he a sojourner? Was he a representative who was based in China? You know, was he a sectoral trader? Uh, was he a long distance trader? If he represented the Persian court, which ones are we looking at here? Um, and so on and so forth. Um, I think the reality is that we cannot answer any of these questions. Um, but what is interesting is obviously the date when this occurs and the implications of it. Now, the Tang records do not actually note that gold articles were, were given as a reciprocal gift to this 824 mission. Right? But if we put all of this information together, then speculatively, what is really interesting is that we could actually sort of spin, and I use the word spin, um, spin a narrative about the possibility of what the Belitong Rec was doing um, and its intent and its, you know, sort of, as it were, its, its, its passage. So if we put it all together, one of the things that we realize is that with the possibility that um, around about 824 AD, um, a Persian vessel arrived in China around about June or July. Um, and in September, a couple of months later, um, this vessel and its traders with its representative presented a Garuwood pavilion as a tribute item or a diplomatic exchange item to the Tang court. Um, it then sailed up to Yangzhou, um, where it stayed for approximately a year while the ceramics cargo was amassed. And then sometime after about 826, so it actually stayed in China for a significant period of time, it then sailed back down to Southeast Asia uh, with the intention of uh, stopping in Srivijaya and Palembang just to refit the ship before it would go back into the Indian Ocean. Uh, and unfortunately, before it arrived in Srivijaya, it was hit by a storm uh, and it foundered. Um, I've, I've been always told, and I, I'll, I'll, I'll end here, um, I've always been told that obviously this is highly speculative, and that is really true. Um, but what is really interesting is that the Belitong Rec uh, provides us with an opportunity to try to reconstruct something of this nature. Um, and uh, because of that, it's actually an extremely um, important shipwreck that provides us with a sense of the multifacetedness, I think, of the nature of Middle Eastern Chinese trade at the first, in the first half of the 9th century. Thank you.